night. Good morning again, Mount Movers Church. Today is a really, really special day. I'm glad to uh, see you guys here this morning. I know that when you walk away today, at least I'm believing, that you're going to be really encouraged um, by what you experience, by the presence of God that you feel and experience today in this place. In just a few moments, we're going to celebrate some life change like uh, it's the way we like to do life change. We like to, we kind of like to party <laughs> a little bit because, you know, that's, that's what heaven's going to be. Right. It's just one big incredible party. And so uh, I think church should never be boring. I think it's a sin that we should repent of if we're ever boring in church because God is not boring. He's a creative God. You look around at creation, you look around at life, and, and God has been so creative. Look at yourself in the mirror and you will see how creative God has been. Uh, God's exciting. Serving God is exciting. Living for God is exciting. And here in just a few moments after we share today's message, we're going to go into a time of baptism and we are just going to just blow the roof off this place and celebrate with the angels of heaven a real contagious life change. So get ready, get ready, get ready for what is about to come. Okay. We want to bring part four of this series that we've been in, Ready for Anything, all right? Uh, today, the title is Sooner Than You Think. We're going to talk today about the timing. We've been talking a lot about the rapture the last few weeks. We've been trying to paint a clear picture of what God's Word has to say about Jesus and His return. That's right. I said Jesus is returning. Jesus is not dead. Come He's on. alive. He's not in the tomb. We've, we've had the, the privilege of being in Israel. We went to the garden tomb, and he's he not there. there. He wasn't there. Right. Uh, he's alive. He's alive and well uh, more than ever before. He is our king, and he's coming back. And today, if, I just want to say before we get into this, if, if you have not caught any of the previous messages in this series, please, please, please go back and watch them or listen because it, it will really, really enlighten you and encourage you as to how powerful God's word is and how detailed he has been through prophets thousands of years ago laying out a clear path and a picture of Jesus' return. You, you got to go back and, and just see how God has orchestrated the signs of the times in his calendar. Okay. Hey, before we dive in, a couple things. Grab out your phones if you have your phones and check in on the MMC app. Do that for us. You guys have been getting better and better and better. You're killing it. All right, you're killing it. Some of you guys, if you don't have Wi-Fi, do it later in the day. That way we know because we sincerely go down this list and we pray over every single family, whether That's you right. have a need or not. But do you know, sometimes the only way we know what's going on in your life is when I read. And I see you're having surgery this week. Oh, my gosh. We're going to pray over you. And we put it on our calendar. And we're praying over you. This really sincerely helps us as this church grows. You know that the staff in this church are praying for you if you check in. If you don't, ugh. We're going to try to remember every face and every name, but it's hard. Help us out. Check in. Also, share today's experience. I'll tell you this. At the end, we are going to celebrate baptism. Those of you who are here and you're going to be baptized, your friends and family all over can see it through Facebook or through the online platform. You can also share that link with them right now so they can also be blessed with this message. You said I'll show. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't let it go. She said I'll show. Share. Okay. Okay, so real quick, the text for this series is found in Matthew 24 and verse 44. Real quick, it says, you must be, say it with me, ready, ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. What are we saying here? Jesus is alive. Jesus is returning. And there are many, many people that will have their head not in the clouds. Our head needs to be in the clouds. When I was young, my mom told me, get your head out of the clouds. No, mom, you had it wrong. My head needs to be in the clouds. My head needs to be where Jesus is going to return. We've got to wake up. We have to pay attention. We have to be ready because the end, if you will, there really isn't an end, but the end in, the, in, the, in reality of what the end times means, we're right there. We are at the end of the end times. It is here. It is upon us. All right, week number one, uh, we talked about signs of the times. Week number two, we answered the question, what is the rapture? Last week, we answered the question, why does a rapture have to happen? Why the rapture? And today, again, we're covering when, what is the timing of it all? When is Jesus going to return? Um, so, uh, Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, I want to read this to you this morning. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I want you to pay attention to this line right here in verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. 
God is Jehovah God. He is God Almighty. He is Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. He is the one that establishes the time clock. He's the one that establishes the calendar. He is the one who orchestrates everything. And I want to tell you, in Amos chapter 3, verse 17, he clearly says that he has a plan and he speaks through the prophets. He spoke through the prophets of old. And that's why this book is so amazing. It's, it's not just an ordinary book. It is the book. This book is so amazing because it clearly lays out God's plan. He spoke through the prophets and it just blows my mind. The next event on God's calendar, and let's just show the calendar real quick this morning to give you an idea. If you haven't been here, this is, I'm going to go through this very quick, but in other messages we went through this in detail, but we are living in the age of grace right now. Right now you can call upon Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You can be gloriously saved, forgiven of your sins. You can be made new. Today we're going to celebrate baptism. People are going public with their faith because of the grace of God today. It's going to happen in just a moment. But we are coming to an end of the age of grace very, very, very soon. And we will enter into a seven-year period called the years of tribulation, at which time, yes, people will be able to come to Christ. And I imagine there will be a lot of them that come to Christ right after the rapture happens because they are going to immediately realize they waited too long, they weren't ready for Jesus' return, and the next seven years is going to be hell on earth, okay? Seven years of tribulation. They'll be able to come to Christ in that time, but it'll be a, at a severe price. Many will be martyred, many will be beheaded, many people will pay a, a price that is just way greater than you would want to pay. Just come to Christ now, all right? Just come to Jesus now. And then go with us in the rapture. Get your head in the clouds. Okay. At the end of the seven years, we will see the second coming of Christ. Jesus is going to come back again, except he's going to kick butt and take names. He is going to be a different kind of Jesus than you read about in the storybooks as a child. This is the Jesus that is bringing judgment. You don't, you don't mess with that Jesus, all right? Uh, and I skipped the millennial reign. A thousand years on earth with Jesus reigning from Jerusalem with the saints of God. And then the final judgment will come. Um, that's where the great white throne judgment happens. Jesus says, depart from me, you doer of iniquity. I, you never had a real and life-changing relationship with me that was contagious. I threw that in. That's our mission statement. But that's really what he's saying. Depart from me, I never had a relationship with you. He's not going to say, depart from me, you never had religion with me. He's going to say, you never had relationship with me. At which point in time, we will enter into the eternal age of grace. And at that point, it will be too late. No coming to Christ at that point. Everyone's eternity will be set in stone. All right? So that's the timeline. But here's the next event that we believe is going to happen right here. Rapture of the church. According to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. Get ready, get ready, get ready. 4, verse 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. We're going to be raptured out of here, all right, together with him in where? The clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort, say comfort. comfort. Has this series been comforting to you at all? We've been trying to show you how God wants us to recognize that we're not going to be here for the wrath. We're going to be raptured out here. We are going to escape. We're going to ex fuego my ego. We're going to be out of here. We're going to be in heaven. And we are not going to experience the wrath of God because we have not been appointed to that. That's right. Amen. Come on, give God a hand. Come on. If you don't know what a fuego means, then you must have been sleeping last week because a <laughs> fuego means escape. And last week we talked about the fact that when we go in the rapture, we will escape the wrath of the Lamb that is to come. Brett's throwing in corny jokes from previous messages. So you got to go back and check them out to know what he's saying. All right. So today we are dealing with the question, when will the rapture occur? When will it happen? How many of you guys would like to just know so you could mark it on your calendar? Just like, so I'll be ready. You know what I'm saying? I am the kind of person I'm all about planning. Like, tell me next Sunday, my daughters turn 16, my twin daughters. If you don't know, high five them. They turn 16. It's on my calendar. It's big. All right. I just plug that. They're going to they're gonna love that. All right. I wish I could just plug it in on my calendar, rapture of the church, so that I made sure I didn't miss it. 
But I want to show you something. When we talk about this, it's kind of a play on words. When will the rapture occur? Matthew 24 and 36 says this. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Say that. No one knows. No one knows what? The day or the hour. Follow me. Not even the angels of heaven, but only Father. Only our Father in heaven. However, we clearly will know the season. And that's what we're going to talk about in today's message. All throughout this series from day one, part one, we talked about the signs of the time. We are talking about the fact that God laid out with his prophets the season and the timing of how everything would lay out. So though we don't know the actual day and time that I can mark it on my calendar and make sure I don't miss the party, we can know the season and for that we are to not be asleep. As believers, we are to be aware. We're not to be ignorant. And we're to come for one another when we see things getting really rough in our world. Anybody seen anything really rough? Who's ready for 2021? Bring it on. I can't wait till Wednesday. You know what I mean? Like, let's get through this 2020 election. Let's get through this year. Let's get on with whatever's going to happen because we're over it at this point. But here's the thing. God says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to comfort one another. So go with me this morning. We're going to go to Hosea 6. Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And I'm going to read it to you. If you've got your Bible, you can read along with me. Come and let us return to the Lord. God is talking to Israel, all right, through his prophet. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us. And I'm going to pause right here before I finish this passage out. This is talking about the fact that God has brought judgment upon Israel, okay? If you've been with us any time at all, we've talked about how the Israelites went away from God in rebellion and disobedience. God made them go into exile for 70 years. And then everything we start seeing is this timeline of prophecy of how God is going to bring Israel back to the homeland. He's actually going to bring the Jewish people back to Israel, establish them as a nation, and then this whole timeline Brad went over a second ago begins to go down. Okay, so you need to understand this is who he's talking to. So he says he has stricken, but he will bind us up. Okay, it's kind of like a parent. You spank their butt, then you hug them, right? I don't know. That was my parenting style. Now they're too big. But go on to verse 2. It says, after two days, say two days. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. This is really important. Starting in the calendar, in week, in week one, we talked about the calendar, okay? There is B.C., before Christ, and there is A.D., okay? After, after the coming of Christ, after he rose again, we've got the A.D. calendar. When you look at the A.D. calendar from zero to 1,000, I want you to think about is a day, okay? I'm going to explain this in a second. From 1,001 to 2,000 is day two, and from 2,000 to 3,000 is day three, Okay? The Bible says in a minute, we'll read it to you, but one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day to God. All right? So when we read this passage right here, it says, after two days, he will revive us. In part two, we, or in part one, we talked about when Israel became a nation. This is not a pop quiz, but if you know the answer, it's 1948 that Israel became a nation. 1948 would have been in the second day that he would have revived the Jewish people. All right? Follow me. On the third day, he will raise us up. And it goes on to say, not only will he raise us up, but that we may live in his sight. What year is it? They're all like, I don't know. I might get it wrong. <laughs> it's 2020! We are actually currently living in the third day. So what this tells us is when we start looking at the season, we are living in the third day. It is 2020. We are currently living in the third day. And it says that in the, the, third, the third day, day, we are coming to the end of the third day, that he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. Look at 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3, verse 8. Peter makes a statement I just told you a second ago, and it says this. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. All right? Very important. I know today we're going to kind of go fast because we've got a lot to get in. But you need to understand that we are presently living in that third day. And so why are we doing this series? Because we want to make sure that no matter what 
happens, no matter what is to come, that you are ready, that your household is prepared, that your friends, that your family are ready for the coming of the Lord, all right? Go with me now to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, this is a very prophetic chapter in the Bible. Matthew 24, I'm going to start reading in verse 3, and it says this. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. As he sat there at the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when all these things will be, and what sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. You will see, back up, see that you are not troubled, for all these things shall come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilence, which we told you in part two, I believe, that COVID-19 has been considered now a pestilence. That's the definition of it. And earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, I want you to jump on down to verse 32 in the same passage, okay? It says this, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. What Jesus is explaining is basically, hey, look around. You can see the changing of the seasons, right? How many of you guys can step outside right now and you can tell there's been a change of a season? It used to be on Sunday afternoon after church that Brad and I would go out on the lake with our kids and they would wakeboard. But you can step outside today and realize that the seasons have changed and we would be the biggest idiots if we were out there on the lake this afternoon wakeboarding, right? Seasons have changed. So when I go outside and the leaves have started turning colors, I know what's coming? Fall. And I get depressed. Why? Because I know winter is following fall, okay? I'm one of those summer people. Such a Debbie Downer. I know. I try really She's hard. She's like, winter's coming. I'm like, you are so negative. Look at how beautiful the trees are. It's crisp. It's cold. We can roast marshmallows. No. Goodness, go ahead. Give me summer. Give me the heat. But Jesus is explaining. You can see the changing of seasons, okay? Verse 33. So you also, when you see all these things, all right, catch this. What all what things? All those things I just read to you in verses 3 through 8. Wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, disease, earthquakes, all of those things happening. He says, when you see all of these things, know that it is near. Know what is near, right? The end of the time. We're talking about his return is at our door. Assuredly, I say to you, this is the part I want you to underline in your Bible, this generation, say generation, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. What is all things? The timeline we started with. Everything you just read. Everything that I just read in the timeline that you saw. A generation will not pass away until all of those things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So what this is saying in layman's terms is that there is going to be one generation of people who sees all of those things happening, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, earthquakes happening all over the place, and we see all of the end. We see it all the way to the end of the end times, okay? Now, we know that this could not have been the generation that was living when Jesus was present because they all died. There's also been generations all throughout history who have seen some of all of those things. But this generation is the generation that has seen all of those things beginning to lay out, all right? Now, notice also, those are plurals. Wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, that's plural. What does a plural mean, English teachers? It means more than one, right? So we're not just talking about one. There is more to come, all right? But there is one generation that is going to see it. So now you say to yourself, well, how do we know when that generation began? And how do generation? we know what a generation is? All right, what is it? Okay. The generation began in 1948 when Israel was made a nation. Okay? You can go back to part one. You got to kind of put it all together. Okay? I can't take it all back all the way through it. But when, when Israel became a nation in 1948 is when it began. So how long is a generation? 
let me read this passage to you. In Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10, it says this. The days of our lives are 70 years. When I was little, I used to think that was so old. And now I think that is so young. Yeah. <laughs> the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only in labor and sorrow, for it will soon cut off and will fly away. So we know from this passage I'll that a gener away, do not oh sing. Glory. Stop. <laughs> fly away in the Let's morning. not. All right. I die, hallelujah. Are you guys encouraging I it? Die. Oh, good Lord. Fly. That's, that's, when church, that's when church music was good. It was. We need to bring it back. You need to Jesus go back. In Jesus' name. Yes. We're starting a southern gospel group this week at MMC. <laughs> Go ahead. One of you families need to take him home with you this afternoon because he does that to us all the time and we're like, stop. Okay. So we know from this passage, Psalms 90, that a generation is 80 years. All right? So from 1948 to today, you can do the math. We're already past 70 years. We're already past 70 years. Now, what does that mean? Let me just tell you, okay? We started off this passage by saying no one knows the day nor the hour, but we are not to be ignorant of the season. When you begin to study the word of God and you begin to watch how he lays out prophecy and it comes to pass, what that tells us is that when we study the prophecies that are yet to come, we can expect them to happen, all right? So are we putting a timeline? Am I going to mark it on my calendar? No, but I'm going to live like I'm ready, all right? I'm going to be ready because here's what I can tell you. The tribulation is seven years. And that passage I read you in Matthew said that all things, all things meaning all the way to the end of the age, all the way through the end times, which is another seven years. Included, you can do the math. Included in the 80 is what you're saying. Included in the 80. So you can do the math, but that tells me our time is so short. So let me just be clear. So if we were to do the math, and if we're interpreting scripture the way we are, then what you're saying is, is there, it could be a two-year window that Jesus could, could be. come back. However, I will say this, okay? We're not saying. We're not saying that because here, here's what I'm saying. Scripture interprets scripture. You can study it for yourself, but here's what I am saying. Prepare like you're going to be here for another 50 years. Mm -hmm. Get married, have kids. Put money into retirement. Invest. Invest. Pay off your debt. Do all of those things. I've heard people say, you know what? If Jesus is coming, I'm going to go buy my dream truck. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I'm I've ever to I'm going to eat whatever I want. Sunday carbs don't count. They Jesus <laughs> carbs. And I'm a, I, he wants me to be happy. I'm like, no, that is stupid. More that chips. That is stupid. You live like he's not coming for 100 years, okay? You prepare like he's not coming for 100 years, but you live like he's coming today. Right. You live ready, like he could come any moment, because the truth is, he really, really can. Get your house in order. Okay, so we got time. All right, well then, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. All right, so let's go to Leviticus 23. I'm going to just, I'm going to wow your socks off, because it wowed my socks off when I studied this out. And, you study and the Word of God, is it is so cool. Great. Guys, God is so awesome. Okay, Leviticus 23, verse 1. Where's it at? Leviticus 23. I'm going to read it from here. All right. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, speak to the children of Israel. Do you guys know who Moses is? Okay, I don't have time to go into it. But in the Old Testament, Moses was the Jewish leader that led the children out of Egypt, out of slavery. He had millions of the Jews in the desert, okay? And he was led by God to, um, to release them and to help them start pursuing God's promise for them into the promised land. While they were out there, God spoke many things. That's where we get the Ten Commandments. It's, it's where we get so many writings God spoke through Moses. But one of the things that God established through Moses was the establishment of feasts or holidays that God wanted the Jewish people to remember based on the things that God had done with his people. So these feasts are really, really important because they parallel prophetically 
to what God was going to do through Christ, his son, in the future. All right, this is one of those wild things that just like you can't believe thousands of years ago, he lays this out on these dates and then makes things happen that correlate to his son on the same days thousands of years later. All right, so here it is. Um, he says to Moses, speak to the children of Israel, verse 2, and say to them, the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts, all right? So the word feast in Hebrew, moed, is an appointed festival, all right? Feasts are appointed festivals, but a convocation is a dress rehearsal. It's a dress rehearsal for something that God is going to do in the future, all right? So, oh my gosh, check this out. Throw up the slide that has all the feasts, the seven feasts, all right? So these feasts that God established through Moses for the children of Israel, there's seven of them, and four of them happen in the spring, all right? And they've been celebrating these feasts for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds of years. Four feasts in the spring and, and three feasts in the fall, all right? If you know any Jewish people, ask them about the feasts, all right? Tell them how they, ask them how they celebrate these festivals. It would be really interesting. So let's go through these feasts really quick. So the Feast of Passover... If, if you want to go, like, all out nerd, all right, go back to our, our Easter series and go through all those, all those services, all those messages through the Easter series and learn all about Passover. It'll blow your mind what, what God did through Christ. And if I could just jump in here, I didn't want to completely go nerd on you, but I love geeking out over um, dates and Bible. But Nisan, on the 14th of Nisan, I'll just tell you one day, was the day of Passover. That is the day they were told in Leviticus to celebrate Passover, Nisan the 14th, all right? And then each day, the 15th was the next festival, the 16th was the following one, all right? And so when you begin to study this out in the Old Testament, they forever were celebrating these festivals, Passover. They'd go out, they'd go get the lamb, they'd cut the little lamb's head off, right? They'd drain the blood, they would eat the lamb, and then you come into the New Testament, Testament, and literally on the day, the 14th of Nisan, that go listen to our day. Easter message, Passover happens and Jesus dies on the exact same day, proving what? That John the Baptist said it when he got ready to baptize Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who was getting ready to make his way down and be baptized in front of everybody. That's a bonus right there. That wasn't even in the message. But that's what happened. On the day of Passover, Jesus laid down his life. And if you go back to part one of this series, you'll see how the angel spoke to Daniel the prophet and laid out a number of days and said, on this day, right. hundreds and hundreds of years from right. the beginning of the calendar that he, that he established, he said that the Messiah will be exposed and be revealed. Right. And it was on that day, on right. the Passover day, like God brought Jesus to humanity and, and had him to be crucified on the day that he told the angel to tell Daniel hundreds of years earlier. And still, here's what blows my mind. I, the Jewish people are God's chosen people. God loved them. They are God's people. But there's so many of them. You have to pray, pray, pray for Israel. Pray for the Israeli people that God would take the scales off of their eyes, that they would see Jesus is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is who he says he is. Mind-blowing. Okay. Passover. On that day, feast day of Passover, Jesus dies. On unleavened bread, which is the next feast, Jesus was buried. Okay? And um, leavening represents sin. So Jesus died with our sins. He took your sins and my sins, and, and I'm sure there's plenty of them to go around. He died with our sins went to the grave with our sins. And on, on the day of first fruits, on, during that feast, he was resurrected. He came to life. He overcame death, hell, and the grave for you and me. Fifty days later, the feast of Pentecost, that's when the Holy Spirit, which was promised in Acts, came. Uh, do you remember when Jesus said, it's better for you that I go because when I come back, it's going to be greater. And, and, and they waited in the upper room and they prayed and the Holy Spirit fell. It was on that day, on the feast of Pentecost, that the promised Holy Spirit came and fell on God's people. Okay, so here's what I want to show you. God establishes his end time calendar starting with these four feasts. And he made these promises happen on these feast days. Okay? There's three feasts left. On the prophetic calendar. On the prophetic calendar where big events have not happened yet. 
And everything that happened on that day through Christ had a parallel that was tied to the way God established that feast with Moses hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. And there's a, a foreshadowing of what he was doing through the children of Israel to what Christ did and how it affects us. There, there's, a, there's a line drawn through it all. So the four feasts in the spring have all been fulfilled prophetically. Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. There's three feasts still yet to come that have the events have not happened or transpired. The next event, the next feast that has not seen a prophetic fulfillment of prophecy is the Feast of Trumpets. I'm just, this is for dramatic effect. The silence is for <laughs> dramatic effect. Well, if you pause too long, I'm going to preach your point. Well, go ahead. This is exciting. <laughs> I want it to sink in. I want to go back real quick. I want to go back real quick. First Thessalonians. Tell me when I'm running out of time because I'll just keep First going. Thessalonians First Thessalonians 4. That's where Bring he wants to go. Can you go back to it? So what's going to happen? When the rapture happens, you're going to hear a shout and a, long, and a blast of a what? Trumpet. trumpet! That's right. When the last trumpet sounds, that's what's going to happen. So, so what we're seeing is the fulfillment of trumpets where there's a, there's a tie between the resurrection, or between the rapture and the feast of trumpets. Can I also jump in here while yep. you're getting ready for your next part? Yep. So during this, during this festival, I was going to anyway, but I was going to politely ask. I could tell. During... You During this festival, they actually blast the trumpet 100 times, all right, over in the, the course of, of two days. days, in the course of two days, and they do it in these segments, okay? But the very last one, the hundredth blow of that trumpet is known as the last trump. Now, I don't even have it up there for you, but last week I read you the passage of Scripture. Well, it might be on, on the screen. I can't remember. But it says that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that's when we will be gone, right? We talked about moment being a tomos. It is one one millionth of a second. It said the last trump. The Jewish people understood what you and I don't. You and I are like, last trump? Like, who plays trumpet? Like, I don't even know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I could bring you over. We have a shofar in the office. It's beautiful. It's way up high on our shelves. It was from Israel. That's actually the trumpet that they would have been blowing. But that hundredth blast, they knew what the last trump meant. It was the end of that big festival and they understood that rapture had to do, we understand that rapture has to do with those trumpets, all right? Okay. We're looking for that festival. So you might ask yourself, all right, when does this festival happen? Question. That's a good question, isn't it? It happens in the fall. And it changes every year because the Hebrew calendar is a little bit different than the Western calendar. But typically September into October is when this feast happens. Now, am I saying Jesus is going to come back during this feast? I can't say that because I'm not God, and only God knows. But here's what I am saying. All the other ones. He's landed. already done it with the other four feasts. Why all of a sudden would he change his game when the rapture is the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets? Don't you think? I mean, I'm just asking you. I mean, don't you think that he would probably do what he's already done in the last four feasts? So my theory is, and I could be wrong. My theory is he's going to come back during the Feast of Trumpets. Well, the Feast of Trumpets this year has already passed. So I'm looking for the next one, right? He could come back during that feast. Now, that feast is two days. So you could easily say that nobody knows the day because there's two days, and nobody knows the hour because there's 48 hours and two days. So nobody really knows the day or the hour, but we do know that he is returning. We do know I want to share three different titles that the Hebrew people give for this Feast of Trumpets. They call it Rosh Hashanah. Have you guys ever heard of that before? Which is their new year, okay? It's the, that's how they celebrate their January 1. That's the beginning of the Hebrew calendar, is this Feast of Trumpets celebration. The day that no one knows, isn't this interesting? But the third one, if you've been in this series with us at all, this one's really going to blow your mind, especially because the Hebrew people don't really know that Jesus is the Messiah and he's already come. They call the Feast of Trumpets the wedding day of the Messiah. You can give God praise. See, they were in the series. <laughs> and they get it's it. It's starting to make sense. Okay, God, you, you're killing me. Okay, listen. Jesus said, I go now to prepare a place for you. If it weren't so, I would have told you. He's going to prepare a place for you so that he can come back and receive you unto himself. Because in the Hebrew culture, 
the groom would leave for a year during the, um, during the engagement period. He would add on to his father's house and build a room for them to live in once they got married. So it's bridal language in the Hebrew culture. You got to go back and listen to the last couple messages because this is crazy. This is crazy. Jesus is coming back. So here's the question. Are you ready? Are you awake? Are you being sober-minded in the way you're living? Are, 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 you, are you hearing what God is speaking to your heart? Are you seeing the signposts? If I head off for Tulsa right now, I need to pay attention to the signs, to the exits, to know where I'm supposed to get off, right? The same thing is with the times that we're living in. God, we are that generation. We are the generation from 1948 till now that has seen all of these things. We are the only generation that has seen all of these things. God could not have made it more clear that his son is alive, that there is hope, there is forgiveness, there's victory in Jesus, and he's coming back. He's coming back. But he's coming back, his word says, for a spotless bride. He's coming back for a spotless bride. What does that mean? Man, get your life straight. Get your priorities right. Make God your priority. Man, be in church every time the doors are open. Get in a life group. Yes, give the church your money. Tithe. Why? Why? I'm not afraid to say that anymore. You want to know why I'm not afraid to say that anymore? I used to be really cowardish about it in the beginning. I'm like, well, I don't want people thinking I'm like those televangelists that do all they want is your money. And now, dang, we want your money. Here's why. There are people dying and going to hell. And we will spare no expense in these last days to do whatever we have to do to reach as many people with the hope of Jesus Christ as we possibly can. Far from satisfied. Your neighbors are dying. Your coworkers are dying. Your loved ones, people you love, could go to hell. That's what this church is all about. That's, that's the lifeblood of what we do. Just get in the game. Get ready, get ready, Can get I ready. just plug before you pray? You see that first fruits right up there? When you talk about tithe, and this is just a bonus message, okay? Tithe is first fruits. That's actually what it is. Yeah. God gave his first fruit when he gave his one and That's only right. son to die for you and me. And when he was resurrected, that was his first fruit. That was his, that was his tithe. I don't have time to teach all of that. But you've got to understand, God never did anything. He's never asked you and I to do something he didn't already do himself. He always goes before, and he always sets the example. And that's exactly what he's already done. Guys, we've got to get ready. And you know what? I want to tell you, just like we told you in the beginning of this series, this isn't anything to get scared about and to be fearful. This is exciting. It's this comforting. is comforting it's to comforting. know that this crazy world we live in, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to rescue his spotless bride. He's going to take the church home. That's what we're going to celebrate baptism in just a couple Come minutes. Come on. People who are ready to say, I will boldly stand up yes. and proclaim that I live for Jesus. Yes. For far too long, the enemy has distracted people to say, you know what? I don't want anybody to like be offended. I don't want, I don't want to be embarrassed by my faith. Are you kidding me? The end of the world is going to happen. I'm going to boldly stand and I'm going to tell people I live for Come Jesus. On. I love Jesus. Come He's on. the Lord of my life. You got to get bold people. Okay. So listen, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to over you. Pray that you would get your head in the clouds and get ready. Pray that God will give you a hunger to go after everybody you know to help them come to Jesus in these last days. And then we're going to transition and go and, and ask those that have signed up to be baptized to go and prepare. Uh, we're going to play a song first. But the rest of this met, the rest of our time together is going to be so amazing and so encouraging. So just let's get on with it because I cannot wait. I'm like shaking because I'm so I love, we haven't baptized in so long. This is the first time that we've baptized. Building. In, this building. in this building. It's so exciting. Let, COVID I, made us cancel our first I, baptism. I, gotta, I have to share this really quick before we pray. Uh, so I love making the devil mad. It just, I just, it brings me a joy that is, I can't, I can't put words on it uh, because he has lied to me so many times and deceived me into believing things were true about my life that was not true. Caused me to, to convince me to, to, to do things I should have never done, made decisions I should have never made. And I know he's done the same to you. And I, I just, I, I hate him with a holy hatred. And uh, I love making him mad. So we made him really mad. I know that we made him mad. We've been, you know, preparing for this baptism. We get the tank filled on Friday, and we come up here on Saturday morning. Man, we've all, all of our ducks are in a row. Everything's ready. Uh, it, it leaked. <laughs> there was water all over the stage. And the so the tank we spent, was unloading on spent, the stage. <laughs> we spent yesterday. Uh, 
I, I, I'm not going to brag, but I'm kind of like Bob Vila, you know, um, or Tim. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can fix stuff. <laughs> so. <clears throat> I'm going to move out of the way of the lightning right with now. The with, <laughs> with a little bit of caulking and a whole lot of uh, marine tape. Um, we went around the edge of this sucker. Um, we were here last we're night set. really super late with heaters <laughs> trying to make it dry and then filled it back up and the water is warm and uh, Devil, he wanted us to cancel because we had an empty tank. <laughs> it's like, what are we going to do? But you know, we made him so mad because we have come up against so many obstacles these last two days getting the stupid tank filled. But it has water in it right now, and the water is warm. And we've even put like some uh, chlorination, chlorination in there in so it. there's it's no COVID in it. So we are, and we're ready. We are ready to do this, and the devil is not going to get any credit whatsoever. God's about to be glorified. So let's, let's pray. How about that? Let's pray. Father, we love you so much, and I pray if there's anyone in this room that is not ready, if there is anyone that is watching online today, God, that is not ready, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit right now, you would stir their hearts and cause them to change, cause them to cry out to you, and say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Help each and every one of us today to survey our lives and just to see where we're at, God. I pray that you would align our lives with you, that we would see ourselves the way you see us. We just pray, God, as we are in these last days, that, that you would put a hunger in our hearts to see people come to Christ, that you would put a hunger in our hearts to see people experience hope like never before. I pray that you would stir the heart of this church, Mountain Movers Church, God, that we would reach people like never before with the hope of Jesus Christ. Do something in us, God, as a church in these last days. God, I pray for revival like never before from the north, south, east, and west, that you would bring hurting, hopeless, hungry people, God, to experience your presence in a real way, that they would be gloriously saved, and that we would help people make heaven their home with heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you today, if that is you, and you're saying, I, I don't know Christ the way you're saying, and I want to, I want you to pray a prayer with me today. With heads bowed, eyes closed, if that is you, if you're watching online, I want you to comment all in, if that's you. If you're in this room, would you please raise your hand at this time? We're going to pray together as a church. If that's you, you say, I'm not ready, but I want to be ready. I want to make my life right with God. Thank you. I see your hand. Anybody else today? Anybody else? Thank you. I see your hand. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. And those watching online, just type all in if that's you. Let's pray this prayer together as we um, walk beside those that are coming to Christ today. Father, forgive me of my sins. Jesus is the Son of God. I confess him as Lord of my life. Help me to be ready for your soon coming return. In Jesus' name. Everybody said. Amen. Amen. Amen.